Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank you all for coming and for giving me a chance to talk about my research. I would especially like to thank Professor Chasey, uh, Professor Spazzoni, and the University of Milan. I'm very happy to be here uh, at the launch of the BEHAVE Lab. It's a very exciting initiative and a very exciting opportunity. So, Uh, so, uh, as you have heard, I have recently published a book. It's called Bit by Bit, Social Research in the Digital Age. And this book is for social scientists who want to do more data science and data scientists who want to do more social science and anyone interested in the combination of these fields. So I spend time in both of these communities. I'm a professor of sociology. And as you heard, I also spend time in companies with data scientists, like at Microsoft Research and at the New York Times. And what I see is that these two communities have so much to benefit from coming together. It's kind of like you have two friends and you know that they would like each other and so you have a party to make sure that they get to meet each other. This is how I think about this book. It is a party to bring together social scientists and data scientists so that each community can learn from the other community and also each community can contribute to the other community. So while I've been working on this book, one question that I get very frequently is this one. Isn't computational social science just a fad? And here I have a very clear answer, which is no. Um, and let me tell you why I think this is not a fad. And the reason is that it, because it is being driven by a change in the world. So the world is changing going from the analog age to the digital age. In some parts of our society, this transition is complete. Other parts are beginning or in the middle of this transition. This transition will happen whether researchers take part in this or not. So I look at this as a very exciting opportunity. Companies and governments are investing huge amounts of money transforming society to build incredible infrastructure to do measurement of social behavior. So as researchers, we have the opportunity to ride this wave of energy, or I think if we do not, we will be left behind by people who are. So I think this is a very exciting opportunity. I also want to be clear that I think this, all this energy and measurement infrastructure creates important ethical questions for us as researchers. And I think it's important that researchers are a part of this discussion along with companies and governments. So when I say that there, it is not a fad, uh, that does not mean that there are not fad-like things happening. And so I like to think of this graph called the hype cycle. This is uh, developed by a company called Gartner. They use this to <clears throat> think about what happens anytime a new technology gets introduced. And so here, the x-axis is time, the y-axis is visibility. And so initially something happens and then everyone gets very excited. So people say, oh, big data, this will save the world. This will end poverty. This will make everyone happy. And then people move, so this is this peak of inflated expectations. And then I think people will realize, and some people have already started to realize, well, actually there are a lot of problems with these big data sources. The sampling properties are not very good. Uh, sometimes they include behavior that we're not interested in. Sometimes they don't include behavior we are interested in. And so people move into this trough of despair. But then, after a while, researchers figure out how to solve these problems. Because that is what we do as researchers, is figure out how to solve problems. And then we move to this plateau of productivity, where these new sources of data and these new techniques are just a part of the way we do our research. And so I want to talk a little bit about what I, as a sociologist, think this plateau of productivity will look like. I think there's two things I want to stress. The first is that these new data sources do not change our goals as researchers. They just change the way that we achieve those goals. 
So for example, if a doctor now has an x-ray machine, that does not change the goal of the doctor. Her goal is still to help make the patients better, but she can now use the x-ray machine to achieve this goal better. Likewise, digital age, data sources, and methods don't change our goals, they help us achieve our goals, the goals that we have had for hundreds of years. Second is that these new methods do not displace old methods, they are complements. One of the things I find very exciting about the BEHAVE lab is the idea of complementarities between methods, and this also applies to all kinds of methods. So just because a doctor has an access to an x-ray machine, this does not mean the doctor would never talk to the patient. That would be silly. So a doctor wants to learn in any way that she can to help the patient. So we should be open to all methods, not only a subset of methods. So this is what I think. So when I think about my book, bit by bit, I think we are trying to, I'm trying to push down this peak of inflated expectations, pull up the trough of despair, and then get us to the plateau of productivity as quickly as possible. So one of the themes of the book and, and is the idea that the future of social research will involve ideas from social science and data science. And blending these ideas together will be incredibly helpful for both communities. And so in this talk, I wanna give two examples of this kind of combination. One of these examples will be from the work of someone else, and one of them will be a project that I'm currently working on right now. So when I think about this combination between social science and data science, I actually like to think about it in terms of art and in terms of this particular piece of art. So as you all know, this is a urinal, uh, but and uh, you also know that this is not just any urinal. This is a very special urinal. This is Fountain by Duchamp. This is one of my favorite pieces of art uh, because it was incredibly creative. And with this piece of art, Duchamp changed what we thought art was and what is possible to be art. And so this urinal reminds me a lot of data science. And so let me explain this connection. So often in data science, people take data that was created for one purpose, such as uh, making money for a company or administering a program for a government, and then they repurpose it into something else and they use it for research in ways that data was never <coughs> intended. And when this is done well, it can fundamentally change what we think research can be. So this, I think, is the style of the data scientist. And then what would be a piece of art that illustrates the style of a social scientist? So I would pick David uh, by Michelangelo. I know that I'm not in Florence, um, but I will be in Florence soon. I'm very excited to go see him. Um, so why did I pick David? Um, so when Michelangelo wanted to make uh, David, he did not look around for something that kind of looked like David. He spent three years making David, the thing exactly that he wanted. And so this reminds me of the way a lot of social scientists collect their data. They think very, very carefully about what they want, and then they spend lots and lots of time collecting this data. <clears throat> and when it works well, it's beautiful. Um, so these two styles, we can call them the ready-made style of Duchamp and data scientists and the custom-made style of Michelangelo and social scientists. So both of these styles, when they are done well, are amazing and spectacular. Um, but I think increasingly we will see the limits of each of these pure approaches. So for example, for the data scientists, they will quickly discover that there are not very many fountains and there are just lots of regular urinals. In other words, there are really limits to what we can learn from data that was not created for research. Occasionally we can do this repurposing and that's great, but there are real limits when the data is not collected for the purpose of research. Likewise, social scientists who are used to collecting their own data it will become increasingly difficult to ignore all the ready-made data that exists and it will become increasingly wasteful. If we want to learn about society as quickly as possible, 
then we want to take advantage of all the data that exists, not just the data that we created exactly in the way that we want it. And so I think increasingly we will see a hybrid style that combines ready-made and custom-made data that combines elements of Duchamp and elements of Michelangelo. And so now I want to give you an example of a project that does this. So this was a project by Josh Blumenstock and colleagues uh, that was published in Science a few years ago. And let me tell you a little bit about the problem that they were trying to solve. So they were very interested in poverty in developing countries. So if we want to eliminate poverty in developing countries, we run into many, many, many very serious problems. One of these problems, perhaps one of the easiest problems to solve, is that it is very hard to know actually how much poverty there is, where it is, and how it is changing over time. So people in Italy, in Europe, in the US, we are very lucky that we have government statistical agencies that measure these things accurately. But in many of the poorest countries in the world, where the data is most needed, it is not available. And so how can uh, policymakers try to decide how to allocate their resources effectively if they don't have any information about the size of the problem and how it's changing? And so he wanted to come up with a way of better being, being able to measure poverty in developing countries at a very minute level for very small geographic areas. Um, and so to do this, he combined a custom-made data source and a ready-made data source, and that allowed him to do something that could not be done with either source individually. And now I will explain how that worked. So he started with call records from the largest mobile phone provider in Rwanda. So they had data about 1.5 million customers over several years. And this data included call level records, so which number called which other phone number for how long, what was the location of the caller, and what was the location of the recipient. And millions and millions and millions of these records. So this is incredibly detailed data, but it does not contain any information about the thing that he cared about and policymakers cared about, which is poverty. It is correlated with the thing that he cared about, but it is not the thing he cared about. And so he collected some custom-made data. He did a survey. He called the people in the data set and asked them a traditional survey that had been well validated to measure poverty in developing countries. So this is the custom made data set and then he linked these two things together. So the first thing he did is what data scientists often call feature engineering or what a social scientist might call um, data cleaning and data preparation. So he took the data that was one row for each phone call and he turned it into a big data uh, rectangle that was one row for each person and then one column for each variable, or what a data scientist might call a feature. And so these features would be things that you might expect, like number of outgoing calls, number of outgoing calls to other countries, number of incoming calls. But he also had many, many features that were automatically created by combining the features that he imagined as a social scientist. So there was a feature that was the probability that someone that you call will call you on a Tuesday. And many, many combinations of lots and lots of features because these were generated by an algorithmic procedure. So then he used these features, some of which were created by sort of social science theory, some of which were created by a data science practice. And then he built a machine learning model that tried to predict what people will say on the survey based on their call records. So you can imagine this as a linear regression, but he used a more complicated machine learning procedure which allowed him to work well with many, many, many variables in the model. Then once he had that model, he used it to estimate the survey answers of all 1.5 million customers. So by asking 1,000 people and combining it with these data records, he is able to as approximate what would happen if he gave this survey to 1.5 million people. Then he was also able to estimate where these people lived. And so he did this by approx uh, looking at where people make their phone calls at night. 
and it turns out that is a pretty good approximation of where you live. What he did was a little bit more complicated, but that's the basic idea. So now he has where everyone lives, and he has estimates for uh, their level of wealth, and he is able to produce high resolution maps of poverty in Rwanda. So to give you a sense of the scale, this uh, grid, this square here is one kilometer by one kilometer. So he is able to produce estimates at extremely small levels of the amount of wealth in these areas. And so now you may be wondering, well, is this accurate? And the answer is, we don't know. <laughs> and the reason is that no one has produced estimates that are this detailed before. So this is a challenge with many new methods, is that it can be often hard to validate them. But if we aggregate these estimates to the regional level, then we can compare them to estimates that come from a different source, which is the Demographic and Health Survey. So these surveys are run um, by the US government in developing countries to measure information about health. And these are very expensive, high quality surveys using standard probability sampling, face-to-face -face interviews, high quality uh, interviewer training. This is as best we can come to a gold standard estimate in, a, in, a, in these settings. So if we aggregate to the regional level, here are the estimates that come from combining the ready-made data and the custom-made data. And here is the estimates from the custom-made data. So they look quite similar. In the paper, there is obviously a very detailed comparison. For our purposes, I will say they are very similar. Um, so this is very exciting that using this combination of ready-made and custom-made data, we can produce very similar estimates than we get using what we would consider to be a gold standard measurement. But there is one other thing that I have not told you yet, which is the approach that uses the ready-made data is 10 times faster and 50 times cheaper. So I want to be clear, this is not 10% cheaper or 20% cheaper, this is 50 times cheaper. So that does not mean that I think we should cut the budget of the demographic and health surveys by a factor of 50. Uh, it means that I think we should collect 50 times more data. So right now the demographic and health surveys happen every five years. And a lot happens in five years in Italy and the US. We don't need to wait every five years to have a measure of our society. We get important measurements, let's say every month, like the unemployment rate. And so if you can cut the cost by a factor of 50, you can move from collecting data every five years to collecting data every month. And this can be very powerful for science and for policymakers. Now, I also want to be clear, this is not 100% a fair comparison that I'm making here. Because we have theoretical guarantees about under what conditions probability sampling will lead to accurate estimates. And we have 50 years of practical experience <coughs> deploying these methods all over the world. We have much less experience and we have much less practical gu theoretical guarantees about these hybrid methods. So for example, we could do this again in, in a different country, and it might work very differently. It might not work at all. Whereas the standard probability sample, we have strong reasons to believe it will work the same anywhere in the world. However, so this is, you may say, this is a problem with this new approach, and I would agree, and I think that as researchers, this creates for us an exciting opportunity. The theoretical guarantees and the practical know-how that we have about probability-based sampling, that did not arise from nowhere. That was created by researchers. And so now we have this opportunity to create the same kind of theoretical guarantees and the same practical know-how about these new approaches so that policymakers can be as confident in them as they are in the approaches that are used today. So you can see how this study combines the ready-made data and the custom-made data. Uh, just the call records alone would not have been sufficient. Just the survey alone would not have been sufficient. It is only by working together that they are able to produce these estimates. And so when you think about social research in the digital age, I hope you will think about this. <laughs>
I hope this is not offensive to Italian people. I think this is great. This would be like my favorite piece of art. I'm going to show you the flourish. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that is one example of combining ideas from data science and social science. And now I want to give another example of an idea that combines ideas from data science and social science. But not about combining types of data, but about combining styles of analysis. Using data that social scientists have had for many, many years, thinking about them like a data scientist generates new research questions. Um, and so I like to think about this as the difference between uh, beta hat research and y hat research. So for those of you who know about regressions, you know regression is about y hat and beta hat and some error term. And so as a sociologist in my department, most of the talks that I see are beta hat talks. And so they are about a regression coefficient. The normal style is someone comes and has some theory, then they present some data, then they present a regression table, and then there's some kind of test to see whether the beta is different from zero or not. And then the talk is over. That is the standard recipe. Then when I was at Microsoft Research for the year, I went to my first talk there, and there was no beta ads. There was a lot of data, there was a lot of math, there was a lot of theory, there was no betas. What were they doing? They were very focused on y hats. How well can their algorithm make predictions? To give a very simple example, you might want to build an algorithm that predicts whether something is spam or not spam. And so those algorithms are evaluated based on their predictive performance, their y hats, not on their beta hats. So for those of you who know about machine learning, you know that there's an increasingly growing community in machine learning trying to build interpretable machine learning. So this is about bringing the beta hat style of modeling into machine learning. And I think likewise, we will see social scientists increasingly bringing the Y hat style of modeling into social science. And so I'm going to present the project to you today that focuses on prediction, but then eventually in the service of understanding. So we're going to have Y hat in the service of beta hat. So the project that I'm going to talk about is called the Fragile Families Challenge. It's a scientific mass collaboration. Um, Ian Lundberg and Alex Kindle are graduate students of sociology at Princeton, and Sarah McClanahan is a sociology professor at Princeton. And the four of us are collaborating with hundreds of people on this project. So for me, one of the inspirations for this project was Wikipedia. So I love Wikipedia. I think it is beautiful that many people have come together from all over the world to create this intellectual object that is available for free to everyone. And what is really interesting about Wikipedia to me is that it did not require any new knowledge. All of the knowledge that was needed to write the encyclopedia already existed in the world. What was needed to create Wikipedia was a new form of collaboration. And this collaboration was enabled by the digital age. And so then this may make you wonder what other big intellectual problems could we solve together, where all the knowledge already exists that we just need a new form of collaboration. And so I'm very excited about developing methods that allow scientists to collaborate on a much bigger scale because I think there are some problems that we can solve together that none of us can solve individually. So now I will give a very, very oversimplified view of stratification research in sociology. So many of these projects involve an equation, something like this, where we have some outcome, y, that we often call attainment. And so this can be things like academic achievement or occupation or income. Then we often model that outcome in terms of some predictors. And there is a predictable component in that model. And this is often expressed as a regression model. So we might say something like uh, women tend to earn less money than men, even after we adjust for the fact that they may have different levels of education. That would be like a kind of traditional beta hat question. And we focus very much on this predictable component. However, there's also this unpredictable component. And empirically, what happens is that this unpredictable component is actually huge is we almost never talk about this, that the 
R squareds in our models are very, very small, even when we include large amounts of what we think is the predictable component. And so I think it's interesting that even though we are focusing on this one thing, but there's all this other stuff here that we don't even look at. Uh, and so we thought, okay, what if we try to make this unpredictable component as small as possible? So it may be that many social science models have a large unpredictable component because they are not focused on prediction, right? They are not trying to predict as accurately as possible. So what if we said, let's take modern machine learning methods that are designed and optimized to make predictions, and then let's try to take an enormous data set with lots and lots of information about each person, and then let's try to predict as accurately as possible these outcomes, what will happen. So when I talk about prediction in the social sciences, one of the questions I often get is, why should we care about that? That is not something that we do. <coughs> Um, and I think there are a couple of reasons. There are some scientific reasons. So one is that this is a basic social fact about society. Sociologists have long, and economists have long studied the relationship between parents' outcomes and kids' outcomes. So we say, if a, you know, your parent has this level of education, then we expect the kid to have this level of education. This is a question about predictability of life trajectories, but this can be generalized much more to then just looking at a simple relationship between parents and kids. We can say, given any amount of information about someone, how well can we predict the future of their trajectory? This is a basic fact that will vary from society to society and from time to time. Second is a focus on prediction can help us discover new social processes that we are not paying attention to now. So the fact that there's this large unpredictable component if we try to make that go away, that may force us to discover new things and important things that are happening in the world. Finally, there are important policy reasons. So this is an article from the New York Times Magazine uh, about what is happening in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's a large American city. And they are using uh, predictive modeling to help make decisions about whether the state should intervene and investigate families for child uh, abuse and neglect. So let me explain the context. Uh, there are some parents in the US who do bad things to their children. Uh, and the state can sometimes take these parents to court and take the kids away to protect them. And this is a very difficult and um, important but difficult process. So if you suspect that abuse is happening, there is a phone number that you can call, and the person who answers the phone has to decide whether to investigate or not. And the consequences of these errors are high. So obviously, if there is abuse and you do not investigate, that is very bad. Likewise, if there is uh, not abuse and you do investigate, this is very bad, because these investigations are very disruptive. And so we'd like to be able to do as best we can in deciding who to investigate and who not to. And so the city of Pittsburgh has decided to use their administrative records to build a risk score for each family. And they make this risk score available to the person who answers the phone who has to decide whether to do the investigation. Now, some people find this uh, incredibly exciting. They say, we can do better, we can help make better decisions and help protect kids better. Other people find this incredibly scary and dangerous because there is the possibility that these algorithms will build in lots of problems. So if you, in the US, we have not the best history uh, in many ways. So we have a his history of discriminating against certain groups in our society. And if we train these algorithms based on this historical data, then all we will be doing is continuing this process of discrimination. So in English, we have this expression, garbage in, garbage out. You put in garbage, there's no magic in these algorithms. So there's also now the expression bias in, bias out. So if you put in bias training data, the algorithm, which appears to be objective, will actually be biased. And this also applies not just to governments, but also to companies. 
many companies are trying to use predictive models of this kind to do things like hiring people. So let's say we build a predictive model to screen a bunch of resumes to decide who to interview. And if in the past the people doing this screening process were biased against women, and then we continue this process, we will continue to bake in the biases of the past. And so there's, it is both, again, very potentially very scary, but also potentially very exciting because it potentially enables us to do better. And so as a scientist, I think we need some basic scientific understanding of these things so that policymakers and companies who are considering these have some basic facts to help inform their decisions. Okay, so the setting in which we do this predictive modeling is something called the Fragile Family and Child Wellbeing Study. This is a study that Sarah and her colleagues have been doing for the last 20 years. So it's a birth cohort study. They uh, randomly sampled about 5,000 births in urban hospitals in the US. And then they followed these kids over the last 15 years. And this data has been used in hundreds of papers and dozens of dissertations. It's a widely used data set to study disadvantaged families in the US. So this is what the data set looks like to social scientists. So here we have the different waves of data collection when the kid was born at age one, three, five, uh, five and nine. And then the rows are the different types of data that was collected. So there's an interview with the mother, an interview with the father, a visit to the home where they observed the environment and wrote very careful notes about everything in the home. There's an interview with the kid and teachers and so on. So when we started this project, this is the way the data was. There was the year 15 data had been collected, but it was not yet publicly available. Sarah and her research team were preparing the data for public release. And whenever you have something like this, this is an incredible, incredible scientific opportunity that happens in every single longitudinal survey. And it is an incredible opportunity. And so let me tell you what this picture looks like to a machine learning researcher. Looks like this. Uh, so we have a big matrix of about 4,000 families, and we have about 13,000 features uh, or variables collected from birth to age nine. And then we also, over here, have about 1,500 features at age 15 that are collected but not yet available. And so when a mach machine learning researcher sees a picture like this, they often think of doing something called the common task method. And so what that is, is we release some of this age 15 data. So one of the outcomes that we were interested in is the child's grades in school. So I will tell you the other six outcomes in a second, but now we'll just talk about grades in school. So we pick half of the data and release the grades in school to researchers who want to participate in this project. Then those researchers can use any method they want to build a model that takes this background data and predicts the grades in school. And then they upload to us their guesses for the grades in school in the holdout data. And then at the end, we, we keep the holdout data secret the whole time. Researchers are working, working, working. And then at the end, we open up the holdout data and we see who did the best. And we evaluate this not based on who the researcher is, what university they work at, how fancy they are when they give a talk, None of this. It is basically you upload your predictions, we compare your predictions to the truth, we calculate the mean squared error, and we see who wins. And so this creates opportunity for many new kinds of people to participate in the scientific process, and it creates an opportunity for us also to make our work much more comparable. So here, everyone is working with the exact same data set, everyone is working with the exact same outcome, and everyone is working with the exact same error metric. So then it is much more possible for us to compare and learn from what each other is doing. Okay, so the six outcomes, some of them are about the child, the grades in school, and the child's grit. So grit is a psychological measure. It's kind of like perseverance or ability to keep going when things are difficult. We have some measures about the household, so eviction, like whether they were uh, kicked out of their home, and material hardship. So material hardship is a measure of the experience of poverty. So poverty is defined by your income, 
and material hardship is defined by your experience. So this is a series of questions about things like, did you ever not go to the doctor because you did not have enough money? Did you ever have your electricity turned off? Uh, did you ever go to bed hungry? These are the things that are, make up material hardship. And then some of the outcomes are about the primary caregiver. So this is usually the mother, but it is not always the mother. It could be a grandparent or a relative. And whether this person participated in a job training program and whether this person lost their job. So we had 459 researchers apply to participate. Um, and then we use this application process to control access to the data because this data is uh, potentially includes a lot of sensitive information. So we wanted to be sure to protect the respondents who trusted this information with us. And so we went through a privacy and ethics audit and we have a paper here that describes the privacy and ethics audit that we went through, but we think this is a very important way for us to honor the trust that the research participants put in us is to protect their data and treat it responsibly. So people applied to participate. They often worked in interdisciplinary teams and the goal is to make predictions that minimize the mean squared error. So as I said, we just compare the predictions to the truth and to calculate the mean squared error. So uh, the mean squared error is sometimes hard to interpret. So I'm gonna present the result, results in terms of R squared of the holdout set. And so basically I'm gonna take the mean squared error and I'm gonna divide by the prediction, the mean squared error you would get if you predicted the mean of the training data. So for example, if the kids that you have, the GPA, average GPA is 2.9, you could predict 2.9 for every kid. That's a very simple thing that we can compare to. So this measure of R squared holdout goes from zero, which is if you just predict the mean of the training data, to one if your predictions are perfect. So before I show you the results, I would like to have a quick vote to see what you think they will be. Uh, this is very interesting for me to see uh, what are people's expectations in a setting where we have a large high quality data set. Uh, many social scientists would consider this large and high quality collected since the birth of the kid. And we are using modern machine learning methods which are designed to optimize prediction. What do you think the R squareds will be like on these outcomes approximately? So how many people think they will be greater than zero? Okay, so you have to raise your hands because R squared has to be greater than zero. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to keep raising this number and I want you to keep your hand up until you get to what you think it will be. So in the US we call this a Dutch auction, but Andreas might tell me this is not a Dutch auction. Uh, okay, so how many people think R squared will be greater than zero? Okay, good. How many think it will be greater than 0 0.1? Greater than 0 0.2? Greater than 0.3? 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 1. Okay, very interesting. So hands started coming down around 0.4, but there were quite a few people who had their hand up still at 0.6 and 0.7. All right, so let me show you the results. This is the R squared of the best model. So out of the 159 submissions, these are the best. So let me now rescale this for you into what I think is the appropriate scale, which is this. And so everything that is in this data set and all of this machine learning is giving us the blue bars. And there is lots and lots of space. There, I think the dominant pattern in this graph is what we call the vast white space. And so what is that vast white space? This is the puzzle that we are trying to solve now. Um, before I do that, let me ask you whether you, one question, whenever you see a complicated machine learning procedure, one of the first things you should ask is, is this any better than a simple statistical procedure? So to do this, we created a simple model, a linear regression or a logistic regression with four variables, the education level of the mother, the mother's race and the mother's marital status at birth, and then a, a measure of the outcome at age nine. So if we were trying to predict eviction at age 15, we included eviction at age nine. So just with those four variables and a simple regression model, we get this green line. So the other 12,000 variables and all the machine learning 
is giving us something. It is not zero, but it is not a huge amount. Uh, so that is an interesting finding. Uh, let me just show you what this looks like. What does an R squared of 0.2 really look like? So this is a scatter plot where we compare the predictions and the truth. This is the best submission. So if this was working perfectly, all the points would fall along the 45 degree line. And we see that that is not even close. And so this vertical line here, what this is, is the mean of the training data. <clears throat> so the mean of material hardship in the training data was about 0.1. And so if your intuition is that this best model is like predicting the truth with some noise, that's wrong. What is really happening it is it's predicting the mean of the training data with a little bit of wiggle, right? So basically, the, the best way to think about this is it's the mean of the training data plus a little bit, not it is the truth minus a little bit. So this is for the best submission, and then this over here, is for the benchmark model, the four variable linear regression. So qualitatively, these are extremely similar. Here it is for all three of the continuous outcomes, the pattern is qualitatively the same. The best model is very similar to the mean of the training data, and the best model and the, the benchmark model are very, very similar. Now I wanna show you the results for the binary outcomes. This is eviction. So here is the best submission. So the top box, is for the people that were evicted, and the bottom box is for the people who are not evicted. And ideally, what we would like to see is that the model makes much higher predictions for the people that were evicted, and lower predictions for the people who are not. We'd like to see those distributions separated, and we see that they are very, very similar. Uh, again, the benchmark model, qualitatively similar to the best submission, and qualitatively, this is the same for all three of the uh, binary outcomes. So, so far I've been focused on the best prediction, but in fact we can learn much more by the fact that we have this mass collaboration. And we had many, many people working on this using many, many techniques. And so you might wonder um, how, how, what happens if we look at everything together? And so what I'm going to show you now is a heat map where I have one uh, column for each model and one row for each family, and the, the, the intensity of the uh, heat map at that spot will be based on the squared error. So the redder it is, the more squared error there will be. And so you can imagine kind of two kinds of worlds now. One world where the model is the most important thing, and then there, there will be some columns that are very dark red and other columns that are very light, that would be where the model tells you most about what the error will be. A different world is the models are basically all the same, and what really matters is which family. So some families will have dark red all the way across, and other families will have white all the way across. And so here's the result for material hardship. And so what you see, there are actually values here. Basically, for most of the families, all of the models make very accurate predictions. For a small subset of the families, all the models make very inaccurate predictions. And so often now we focus very much on the models. Oh, I use random forest, I use deep learning, I use this, I use that. Basically, these are very similar. The bigger differences are much more between the families than they are between the models. And this is qualitatively similar for all six outcomes. So I think there are sort of two next questions that are, arise from this research that we are working on now, and we hope other people will work on as well. So one is, is it possible to get better predictive performance with this data and this prediction task? This is kind of a machine learning question. If we had just done some kind of this algorithm or combined this algorithm and that algorithm, could we get better? I think it's quite unlikely. Uh, the fact that the error patterns are so similar across methods and we know that people use many different methods because they uploaded their code to us. So as part of the mass collaboration, everyone agreed that their predictions and their code and a narrative explanation of what they were doing will be open sourced at the end of the challenge. And we have all of this code and we see they're doing many different things, but the predictions are very, very similar. 
The second question, which I think is more interesting to me as a social scientist, which is why is the unpredictability so high, even when we're using methods that are designed to focus on prediction, and even when we have what we consider to be a large and high quality data set. And we, have a couple, we think there's a couple contributing factors. One might be that there are not enough cases in the data. So when I talk to Sarah, I say, well, Sarah, there's only 4,000 cases in the challenge. And she says, Matt, there was 4,000 families that we have followed for 20 years. So this is true. Like, this is an incredibly uh, labor-intensive, amazing effort. But if the relationship between the predictors and the outcome is complex and nonlinear, it may be hard to learn that with just the amount of data that we have. It also could be that there are measurement error in some of the variables, particularly the outcomes. And so if there is a random measurement error, then it will be a, there will be a limit to how accurate you can predict something that has inherent noise in it. And then possible that there are important unmeasured variables. And this is something that's very exciting to me, that there, we call this uh, dark matter. Like in astronomy, you know, they have this idea that there's stuff out in the world doing things, but we don't really know what it is. And so to me, I think it's possible that there's lots of important stuff that we don't know about yet, even though we have spent many years trying to understand these families. And so how are we going to go try to find these important unmeasured variables? and um, a measurement error is by doing in-depth interviews. So what we are doing now is we are we use these predictions to help us find the people that are most important to talk to to learn more from. So we find the people who are doing much much better than expected and we find the people that are doing much much worse than expected. And then we also find some kids who are doing as expected and then we go and we interview them. We talk to them, we talk to their parents and we try to understand what it is about this kid that is enabling them to be successful much more than we would expect, or what is causing them to struggle much more than we would expect. And then we hope to do this many, many, many times. And you can imagine this cycle of continuous improvement. So we do systematic data collection, predictive modeling, in-depth interviews. We use these interviews to improve the data collection. And then we do this 100 times. And after we've done it 100 times, we should be better than we are right now. So what's next for this project? We have one community paper where everyone who participated and made a meaningful scientific contribution will be a co-author. And this will include all the data, all the code, and all the predictions that people made. So this can then become actually a new data source for how scientists work together on a problem. We have a special issue of the journal Socius, which is a new open access journal from the American Sociological Association. Uh, Twelve participants in the challenge submitted manuscripts that went through peer review. Those will be published. Those will also be computationally reproducible, so we've worked to make it so that other people can download the code and run it on their own machine. Uh, we have three papers from our own group about how we did this challenge because it was very hard for us and we made a lot of mistakes and it took a long time and we want to make it easier for other people in the future. So we want to explain to people what we did. And so we have a paper, as I said, about the privacy and ethics audit. We have a paper about improving the survey metadata. So this is a, something we were very unexpected about. We, we thought this data was well documented because it had been used by many, many researchers. But it turned out it was not well documented for people that wanted to use high dimensional machine learning. So let me give you a quick example. Some of the researchers said, I want to know which of these variables are unordered categorical variables. So things like race. They are stored in the data set as numbers, one, two, three, four. But you do not want to put those into your model as a continuous thing, one, two, three, four, because it's not continuous. So you want to turn those into what are called dummy variables, or sometimes machine learning calls this one hot encoding. So in a normal social science uh, research process, you might pick 10 variables, and then you can manually do this process using documentation that's written for people to read. But if you want to do this for now 12,000 variables, that becomes impossible. And so we have now rebuilt a lot of the documentation around this data so that it's not just readable for humans, but it's also readable for computers. 
And so we think that by building this more modern survey metadata infrastructure, we will enable other people to use the survey data that we already have in new ways. And then finally, we have a paper about our struggles with uh, computational reproducibility. So we wanted to make sure that other researchers could take the code that people used and run it on their own machines so that they could modify it and improve it. And this turned out to be very difficult. Um, and we have a paper about how we did that and what we learned from that process that we hope will help other authors who want to make their work computationally reproducible and journals that want to make their the papers in their journal computationally reproducible. So this is an example of a project that tries to combine the beta hat style of research and the y hat style of research. We can see that um, sometimes we can reach new kinds of understanding if we start from thinking about prediction. And those are two examples of research that I think is possible when we combine social science and data science. If you're interested in that combination, this is what my whole book is about. Um, there's, again, information on the back table. There's also a website here. Also, for people who are interested in teaching, I teach a lot of computational social science myself, and I know this is a very difficult thing to teach, and it's a very important thing to teach. So as Flamino said, teaching and research have to go together if we're going to train the next generation of students. And so what I've done is I've posted all the material that I use for my teaching here, all my syllabi, all my slides. And other um, professors who are using this book, they have also uh, volunteered to post their syllabi and their teaching materials. So you can go and see how other people are using this book for their teaching. And you can also contribute if you have a syllabus that you would like me to post. I would be happy to do that. And then finally, I want to say that there is a version of the book coming out in Italian. It will be published by Il Molino, uh, and it should be available in less than a year. Um, so I hope that you will enjoy the book, and I hope it will also help you in your teaching. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Hello, hello. Um, so I am uh, Yelena Mijova from the uh, ISI uh, Foundation from Torino, just around the corner here. Um, so one of my questions is about the very first thing you said that it was very cheap to run these um, these new experiments using this data, right? But perhaps you forget that somebody invested into the infrastructure to get this data in the first place, right? Maybe building uh, a cellular network <laughs> is actually a lot of money. Um, so how do you think it's possible to uh, encourage um, people who build these infrastructures, the companies, etc., to collaborate with uh, social scientists to perhaps get this data? This is a great question. Um, it's something that I've thought a lot about as I've spent time in companies. Uh, I like to think that there are a lot of projects that are of interest to um, both, we want to find projects that are not just about advancing what the scientists want, and we want to find projects that are not just about advancing what the company wants. And so for me, I am very interested in this idea of Pastor's Quadrant. This was proposed by an American social scientist named Donald Stokes. And so he talked about the work of Pastor. And in the US at least, there is this idea that there is kind of basic research, and then there is applied research. And these two things fall on a continuum. And so if you believe this, then you may think that working at a company is not really going to help a researcher who is trying to do basic research. And what um, Donald Stokes says is that Pasteur's research proves that this is not a continuum. These are two different things. And so he talks about a two-dimensional grid. So let me give you the example of Pasteur's work about the germ theory of disease. So the germ theory of disease is clearly a very important basic scientific insight. Uh, the beginnings of this work happened while Pasteur was working at, for an industrialist at a factory that was trying to turn beet juice into alcohol. And so the, this process of creating the alcohol, it kept exploding and making a big mess. And Pasteur started to think, oh, is, what is causing this 
problem, and this eventually led to this idea that there are these things that are alive that we cannot see. And so what Pastor's example teaches us is that there is not a one-dimensional continuum between basic and applied. There's really two different dimensions. One is whether the work is motivated by use or not, and the second is whether the work seeks fundamental understanding or not. And so Pastor's work was motivated by use and it sought fundamental understanding. And so when I look for research problems, when I try to collaborate with companies, I look for things in this Pastor's quadrant. Things that are motivated by real problems that companies have or governments have. Th these people have real important problems. Uh, but, and they can also be very helpful situations for us as scientists when we are trying to develop this fundamental understanding. So I look for problems in this Pastor's quadrant. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Ashai. I'm a first year PhD student here. Um, I was really interested in what you said about the, the, the beta hat versus the Y hat. Um, and I was wondering actually, and this is a question I had just going through courses myself, um, would improving the predictability of a lot of these social sciences models, would that um, give us better insights into the beta hat? Like would it actually change our perception of what are the true impacts of the different independent variables and the dependent variable? Or is it just, are we just reaching for like, in terms of the 80-20 rule, the 20% that we don't really need, but you know, we have 80% of the information with the standard models that we typically use? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a great question. Um, but I would say it's not the 80-20 rule, it's like the 10-90 rule, right? There's so much that we don't know. And I think this stuff that we don't know is very important for causal inference. So often what these beta hats are is either explicitly or implicitly is an estimate of a causal effect. And the identification strategy that people are using is selection on observables. They are trying to adjust for observed things that then will allow them for that beta to be equal to the causal effect. Now, the, what that means in practice is you're assuming that none of the unobserved things are confounders. That there are no things that are affecting the treatment and the outcome. And so what I would say is if we don't know what all these things are, how can we be confident that they are actually not confounders? And so what I think we can really help with causal inference is if we go and figure out what is this unmeasured predictors, and some of them may actually turn out to be things that are like instruments, which would allow us to make causal inference, and some of them may turn out to be confounders. To give one example about, let's say we were interested in the effect of being evicted on kids' grades in school subsequently, or the probability that they will graduate from high school. So it really matters why the person got evicted. If the person got evicted because the primary caregiver was struggling with drugs, it is very possible that these, this drug abuse would also affect the probability of graduating from high school independent of the eviction, right? Or it may turn out that the person was evicted because their landlord was retiring and wanted to move to Florida. And then, um, the landlord said, I want to clean out this property and sell it to someone else. So then, this landlord wanting to retire and move to Florida probably doesn't impact the grades of the kids, except, or the, the chance of finishing school, except through the eviction. And so understanding exactly what is causing these things will help us know if we have confounders or not. Last question. Thanks. Um, Gianmarco De Francisci Morales from my SAI Foundation as well. Um, I wanted to follow up on this question and uh, ask you about uh, how do you deal with uh, um, identification, causal identification in cases where, okay, maybe your R square is one, but how do you know really that your uh, model is not overfitting your data or you're, you, know, you, you dredged so much that finally you got the perfect predictions, but how do you know that this is really the causal structure of the, that generated the data? Absolutely, this is a great question. Um, so I wanna talk about two things separately. So first is that perfect prediction does not in any way imply that you have the right causal model. So my favorite example of this is, you know, the rooster 
singing in the morning can predict whether the sun will rise, but that is not a, it's a perfect prediction. In fact, that prediction might actually be useful for people, but it is not the right generative model. Um, so we have to be very careful to remember that passive prediction, the ability to predict what happens if we don't intervene is very different than prediction after intervention. And so what I would say about uh, what we have here, the, the, the rooster example is an artificially constructed example where I've picked something that we know is not the right answer. I would say what Sarah and her colleagues have been doing with the fragile family study is the opposite, right? They have been trying to measure all the things that they think are important and they do not get prediction. So this raises questions about what these other things are. You also mentioned overfitting, which I think is a very important issue that social scientists will have to address more as we start using more methods for machine learning. And so one of the things about the fragile families challenge is that we have explicit held out data. So we are clearly measuring the ability of researchers to learn a relationship and then extrapolate that to data that they have not seen. So just to clarify, like when I talked to some of my colleagues about this project, they said, oh, I can get the R squared all the way up to one. And I was like, great, that's awesome. How do you do that? And they said, we just include lots and lots of variables in the model. And I said, yes, that would get the in-sample R squared up to one, but this is different. We have holdout data. And so I think uh, social scientists will get more accustomed to working with holdout data which is another idea from data science and machine learning that can help us as social scientists build more robust knowledge. Okay, thank you very much Matt.